If you want to build a modern software as a service product, you need to set it up in a very specific way. Doing that is really important because if you don't, you're going to run into a lot of problems. Your software is not going to be scaling very well. Deploying new versions of your software is going to be a pain. Customers are not going to like you very much and your product might very well fail in the end because of technical problems. I'm going to share seven things that you can do to avoid that. It's based on my own experience developing cloud-based products. And it's also partly inspired by something called the 12 Factor app that I'll talk more about in a minute. This video is not Python specific. It's also not really about software design, but that doesn't mean that software design isn't important when you create a software as a service product. It's really important. And thinking about software design is going to help you also decide the kind of technologies that you're going to need to develop the product. And I've written a guide to help you take better software design decisions. This is available at ariancodes.com slash design guide. It's totally free and it details what I do whenever I design a new piece of software, which is based on my experience developing at least three different software as a service products over the last five years. You know, why not benefit from my experience and avoid some of the mistakes that I made in the past? So if you go to ariancodes.com slash design guide, enter your email address, you get it in your inbox right away. I remember back in the day when you bought software, you actually bought a bunch of floppies. I remember buying WorkPerfect 5.1, I think it was about 12 floppies. And then of course, when you install the software at floppy 10 out of 12, you realize that one of the floppies is broken and you have to start over again. Really annoying, ah, the memories. When the internet took off, companies switched from sending you physical disks to allowing you to download the software instead. And now with cloud technology, we don't even need to do that anymore, at least not explicitly. It's simply delivered as a service, thus software as a service. Because the way software is delivered has changed so much, also the way that we design, develop and deploy software has changed, except for maybe products where hardware and software is highly integrated, you're still shipping the software with the hardware. But even then, most companies offer a kind of firmware update mechanism so you can still update the software afterwards. So how do you set up a modern software as a service product? There is a methodology called the 12 Factor App that describes the best practices. It's already quite old. It dates from 2011. It was written by the developers of Heroku, a cloud provider. And in fact, all the other cloud providers and the way that they set up their systems are highly inspired by the ideas posted in the 12 Factor app. Now, I don't want to go through each of these 12 factors in this video. I've put a link to the full 12 Factor app definition in the description if you want to read more about it. But I want to talk about seven things that I think are the most relevant to you. And as a bonus, in the end, I'm also going to share a couple of personal tips of how to make software releases less stressful. So let's dive in. The first of these 12 factors states that you should store the code in a version control system like Git. There should be a one-to-one -one correlation between your code base and the app. So if your app is, say, a website, the code for your app should be in a single repository. It's possible that your app consists of multiple services. You might have a backend, a frontend, a database, a payment processing service, a logging service, etc., etc. Each of these services should have their own code repository, except the ones that you don't develop yourself, obviously. I'll talk more about that later. Now, if your apps, your services need to share code, which happens quite a lot, like certain data structures or interfaces, you need to extract those into separate libraries that each have their own repository. And then you can rely on package management systems to do the versioning for you. For example, if you're building a service with JavaScript, TypeScript and Node.js, there is NPM that allows you to publish your own packages and rely on them in your applications and services. If you're using Python, you can use something basic like pip, but there are also more advanced tools out there like Poetry that help you manage your dependencies and share them between different services. So there's going to be one code base for your application or for each of the services that your application consists of, but there can be multiple deploys. A deploy is a, let's say, a running instance of your software. So there can be a production deploy. That's the system that your customers are using. But you can have other deploys as well, like a development environment, a testing environment, a staging environment. Maybe you want to have a separate demo environment to show your customers different things 
etc. The second point is that you have to make sure your dependencies are explicit. In short, your app shouldn't rely on system-wide installed packages. The dependencies, you specify them together with the app, and they should be complete. If you're using Node.js and NPM, this is going to be in your package.json file. With pip, it's going to be in the requirements.txt file. In the previous point, I said there was a single code base. Now, because there is a single code base, it means that the different versions of your program that are deployed to the different areas, production, staging, testing, etc., are also going to rely on those same dependencies. It doesn't mean that the production version of your app is always exactly the same as the development version. I mean, then it wouldn't make any sense to have a development version. But the way you specify the dependencies is going to be the same. And of course, you can have different branches that serve different deploys, which is normally the, the way you would set it up. The second thing that's important is that there's a way to isolate the dependencies so you're not accidentally using dependencies from the surrounding system. In Python, you can use something like virtual env to isolate your dependencies. If you want to take this a step further, there are also overarching dependency management and isolation systems like Poetry. I'll put a link to Poetry in the description of this video. Even then, there's another layer of isolation that you can apply to your service. And that's the system-wide specification of the dependencies and providing a really isolated execution environment. And the tool that everyone uses nowadays for this is Docker. So Docker is a virtualization layer that allows you to specify exactly the kind of operating system and version that you need of things and install any additional dependencies as well. The Docker file is basically the manifest that specifies this execution environment and also allows you to install the dependencies. This results in a Docker image, a package that you can deploy. Docker containers are the instances of the virtual machines. You then run that image in a Docker container and that's going to provide the isolation that you're going to need. The third point is that you should store configuration settings in the environment. Depending on the deploy of your app, you're going to have lots of configuration settings. And they're going to be different for different deploys. For example, if you have a staging version of your web application and the production version and the test version and the development version, each of these might have a different URL and you need to store that URL somewhere so that you can refer to it in your code. But there are other things that can change as well. For example, you might have to connect to the development database instead of the production database. You may have different credentials for storage locations like Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. You may have credentials for other systems like email distribution systems or uh, third-party integrations. You may even have uh, globally enabled or disabled areas of your code. For example, feature flags to disable beta features in the production version, but you do want to test them in the development version. Or you could have an admin area that's disabled in the production version of the app, a global maintenance flag that you can switch on or off depending on what you're doing in the system, logging settings, and so on and so on. These kind of settings generally shouldn't be part of your code base, so don't put them as constants in your code, especially not the credentials. Feature flags and things like that, you can imagine that they are in your code, but it's always nicer to have a separate place where you put all the configuration settings. A good test to verify whether you've set up the configuration of your app correctly is to think about what will happen if you release all your code as open source. Is that going to introduce any kind of security issue? If it does, you probably need to separate code and configuration a bit more. If you separate configuration settings from your code base, you have way more control over who has access to what resources in your software as a service product. Especially for interns, this is really important because everybody at companies always makes jokes about interns. If you piss off your interns too much, they might be out for revenge. And you don't want them to have access to the production database at that point, do you? The most common place to store settings is in environment variables. The language and OS agnostic, which is nice, and most cloud providers actually offer the possibility to define these variables as part of your virtual service. For example, if you launch a Google Cloud function, you can add environment variables to define configuration settings for running that particular function. You can also use a tool like .env to group your variables in a single .env file. This is especially useful for development environments, so you can provide your developers with a .env file that contains all the settings that they need. It's a bit dangerous though, you have to make sure that you don't accidentally commit the .env file 
to your repository because then you're in trouble. The fourth tip is to strictly separate build and run stages. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, give it a like and let me know in the comments what your thoughts are. This really helps push out the video to new audience in the YouTube algorithm. When you deploy your code, this should happen in three different stages. There's build, release, and run. In the build stage, you convert your code into an executable bundle of some sort that contains any dependencies, any other assets that you need. If you're using Docker, that's basically the Docker image. You then have a release stage that combines that Docker image with other settings of how it's going to run in your backend architecture. So there's going to be environment variables. If you're using something like Kubernetes, there might be settings related to the kinds of machines that it's going to run on, memory requirements in the execution environment, and so on, and so on. The, num the number of replicas that you're going to need of that service. And finally, there's the run stage that actually manages the currently running Docker images according to the configuration that you set in the release stage. Normally, each release should have a unique ID. You will probably have a version number of some kind. And often the Docker image, you also give it a specific name like the ID of the commit so that you know what the Docker image is associated to. When you separate these stages, build, release, and run, it also means you shouldn't change the code in running containers. So don't SSH into a running container and restart the service and slightly change the code. Just create a new release and deploy the app in that way. That way you have one clear way of making releases and it's much easier to see what is the current status of the system. When you change your code, you can automatically build a new Docker image and release it, for example, using GitHub workflows or Bitbucket pipelines or most version control providers have options for this. Tip number five is that you should make a clear distinction between what maintains state and what is stateless in your application. Examples of things that maintain state are services like the database or a cache or file storage. Anything else shouldn't maintain any state at all. So for example, if you develop an API service that acts as a layer on top of your database, it shouldn't have any state. You don't wanna store locally on the server that's running your API service, things like uh, log files or store user activity, etc. Because if you ever decide to scale up and you have multiple instances of that API service, this is going to lead to problems. Instead, store it in a database or in a cache if you only need it for a certain amount of time. Of course, you can use the local file system temporarily if that's needed. For example, if you need to upload an image and you need to store it temporarily so you can process it before you upload it, that's a valid reason to store something. But you have to be really careful that each request that an API handles is really isolated also on the file system level so that you don't accidentally overwrite files that are being processed by a parallel request that's being handled. To give an example of this, at my current company, we have a service that runs code that's submitted by students. It's part of a education system. And what we do is we run that code based on a set of files that we get from a Git repository. So when we handle a code running request, we basically create a temporary folder where we put in those files, we run the code, we return the result of the request, and then we delete any of those files again. The best way to think about this is to assume that basically at any point your service can crash, be restarted, scaled up or scaled down. You don't have any control over it. So you wanna set up the system so that it can handle this properly. And that leads nicely into the next point, which is that you should maximize robustness by adding a quick startup and graceful shutdown. So if you look at applications that are running in the cloud, they generally rely on processes that can be started and shut down at any moment. That's why it's so important that you clearly separate stateful and stateless services. If many of these processes are disposable, it means that it's going to be way easier to deploy changes and scale up or scale down your services depending on what you're going to need. So you need to make sure because of that, that your processes can be started quickly. This means that you need to be careful with services that rely on first loading lots of data remotely or where starting the service relies on complex computations like training a machine learning model first before deploying the service. You can solve this by making sure that the data that a service needs is close to the service, available in the local file system, for example. Or if you rely on complex computations, introduce a stateful component like a cache 
so that your servers can be up and running quickly using a cached computation from a previous iteration of the service. And then you can recompute parts when needed. For example, if there's a change in the configuration. You also need to make sure that cleanup happens properly when you shut down your service. Uh, this can be things like closing the database connection. It's important because too many open connections can actually really slow down your database. And making sure that any local data that you have is synced with a stateful resource like a cache or a database. So in short, these processes are going to be disposable. They can be started anytime, they can be stopped at any time, they can be scaled up and scaled down, and you need to set up your service so that it can handle this properly. I have one more point to share with you, but make sure you watch this video to the end, because after that, I have three quick tips for you to make your releases less stressful. So the final point is that you need to make sure that your development, staging, and production setups are as similar as possible. And nowadays we have lots of tools available to help us achieve that. Docker, for example, not only allows you to run services in the cloud, you can also run it on your local development machine. And that way, your environment, your execution environment is going to be the same for local development, staging, testing, any other deploys you have, and of course, production. This means when you take your app from local development to, let's say, a development server, you're going to run into less surprises because the environments are so similar. So I want to end this video with a couple of quick tips to help you make your releases less stressful. The first is try to do lots and lots of small releases instead of one bigger one. Basically, the idea should be that releases should become boring. And you can do this by, for example, using feature flags to switch off parts of your code that are not yet going to be used in production, but that are still there. Write tests to make sure that those things are stable and that you can deploy with a sense of security. You never get there completely, that's, that's really hard, but at least having testing in place is going to help you release faster because you know that certain core things are at least not going to break. It also means that if you want to unleash a feature, if you have it behind the feature flag, that it doesn't have to coincide with a technical release. So you can simply flick the switch at some point and then that's going to be the release for the customers, but the code was already there for quite a while, has been tested, etc. So. The release, which is basically flicking the switch, is going to be a lot less stressful. Second quick tip to make your releases less stressful is to make sure you have a staging environment. Staging environments should be exactly the same as the production environment, should basically be a copy, but it also has a copy of all the customer data in it so that you can see how your new release is going to respond to the existing customer data and whether customers, existing customers, are going to have a problem when they try to log in or things like that. This really helps create a sense of security that when you release, that at least the system is not going to be broken because there was a mismatch in how the real data looks like versus your development database, which might be quite different. A third tip, I made this mistake a couple of times, is to don't do small improvements right before release. Don't think, oh, wait, I can, I can actually improve this little thing here and it's, it won't affect the rest of the code. Yes, it will affect the rest of the code. And you're gonna find out the hard way if you try to do that right before the release. So just don't do it. Lock the features at some point and only focus on testing and making sure that the, the core functionality as you envisage it for the current release is working as it should. Don't try to fix too many small things at the same time. It's not needed. Release it, then fix the small things, do another release. This video was a bit chatty, but I hope you still found it useful. If you did, give it a like. Consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about software design development. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you soon.